Hello, 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 and welcome to the Real Estate 360 show. Uh, this is Steve Conley, hashtag unemployable. And, and this is Jason O. Miles, hashtag the real estate trainer. Good day, sir. Good day. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a great show today. You know, we're talking about, you know, one of the big four questions that everyone has when they want to be a real estate investor, right? And that is, where do you get the money? Right. Everyone wants to know it. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's a it's a question that a lot of people have to ask. You know, I mean, there's uh, especially when you're just starting out. I mean, even for some people that are, you know, active investors, really. I mean, especially if they're new to investing, I'd say within their first two or three years. Um, where to find the money is always a, a challenge for people. So they're always looking at the hard money deals and, you know, or the hard money companies, I should say, or, or things like that. So, but there are other options out there that are available to them and they just don't know it. This really is one of our no money down strategies, if you will. Absolutely. And uh, what Mr. Jason O'Miles is talking about, hashtag the real estate trainer and, uh, and today he's going to be a pri where to get private money real estate trainer to help fund your transactions. That's right. And so that's what this show is about today. It's, uh, private raising private money, and um, or sometimes like our uh, actual title here at the bottom of the screen says raising private capital. Correct. Capital is the same thing as money just in case, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to sprinkle this show to also with some other information about mindset as we usually do. And so you'll want to stay tuned for all of it as we get through all of, all of the uh, um, exciting parts of our show today. Well, that's for sure, Steve, but you know, mindset has everything to do with everything that we do. And I know a lot of people don't really pay attention to it or they think it's a bunch of hooey, but you're, how you think and how you look at things, how you enter situations, how you act when you're in it is so vitally important to whatever the outcome is going to be or your expected outcome. You know, we talk a lot about uh, this living in fear kind of mentality that so many people do all, well, you know, I hope this works and, you know, maybe that'll work. And they're in, they're in these situations. They allow themselves to be in situations mentally that just takes them completely out of the out of the, the realm of success that they want to be in. I mean, they're you know, they might as well go run out to Vegas and start shooting dice, you know, <laughs> I mean, with that kind of mentality. Well, that kind of mentality, they will, you know, Vegas would welcome them because they will <laughs> fail miserably in Vegas. That's exactly right. That's but, you know, exactly I'm going to go right. way out on a limb here and uh, say something that, you know, uh, honestly, most people are not going to accept or believe or even maybe remember. But uh, we are all way more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. I mean, way more powerful to the point where we are creating our own reality with our thoughts every single moment. And so when you think of something that you want to have done and you want to get accomplished, uh, then you have created it instantly. It's done. It's already there. Now you have to wait for it sometimes for it to show up within your reality, but it's there. It's already done. Now, the reason it doesn't show up is because you're very powerful. And so the, the logical mind, this one right here, uh, that doesn't really know that much, is going to start saying, well, you know, what about this and what about that? And, well, you know, maybe it's not going to work or maybe I got to do this first or got to mm -hmm. do that first or got to find that person. You know, it mm -hmm. comes up with a whole process. None of that's really necessary, but we believe it's necessary. So therefore it becomes necessary mm -hmm. without all that. It would just happen. You know? That's right. That's right. And 
you know, we, we have to make it happen. I mean, we have to allow it to happen, I should say. You yeah. know, we, we have to allow it to. I mean, if you set forth, if you set out there to do something, you know, you, you can't guess. You can't hope. You can't, you know, pray. I mean, yes, you're expecting it. You have to, you have to know, I tell people, in your DNA that this is what you're going to do, period, point blank, really and truly regardless of the outcome. Because, hey, we're not all batting a thousand, right? There are certain mm -hmm. things that we're going to do that aren't going to pan out the way we expect them to immediately right now. So you got to remember, you know, it's the long game that you're playing. It's the long game that you're playing. It's it's just keeping on the grind. You're not going to win every time you go out. You just want your your victories to be infinitely larger than your your losses, if you will. That uh, that's helpful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know that that reminds me of the saying that uh, that I heard a number of years ago, and it is a very simple saying. And it is about time. And uh, what, the, what that saying is, is time will either promote you or expose you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we have certainly stumbled some, you know, we're on the planet Earth. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, it's almost like it has to happen in order to advance forward because that's where all the learning and that's where all the information and that's where all the refinements to our thinking comes from is in the quote unquote failures, if you will. Yes. You know, I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts uh, over the weekend, this uh, reality revolution with Brian Scott. And he's, he was going through um, Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. And Napoleon gave a commencement address and uh, it's quite long. And it was honestly, it was failure after failure. It was like seven or eight businesses and occupations and jobs and so forth that he was in. And, and it always, they always ended up in failure. Somebody came along and, and most of the time, stole his stuff, you know, and just left him penniless. But he also came out with a realization at the end of all that, that uh, he's, he, he's going to win no matter what. And it not might or might not be really money, but money is a result of, of that winning. That's right. I mean, you know, we, we step out there in all these ways, uh, yeah. When you're talking about Napoleon Hill, I mean Napoleon. I mean, he spent the, la the 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 vast majority of his adult life following, you know, multimillionaires around, trying to understand how to make it. But at the same time, he was trying to make it. He was working towards his own personal success. And uh, you know, these are the these are the little bits and pieces of those stories that that kind of go untold. And, and people look at, uh, we were having this conversation yesterday, you and I, you know, people will look at a guy like that and say, wow, he's, you know, he, he made it. He's, he's always been there. You know, and we, we were talking about Colonel Sanders and how, you know, right. he didn't make it until he was, you know, in his sixties, he didn't get the kind of success that he was really, really looking for. The whole, the moral of that story is that they never stopped. They never stopped pushing regardless of what, quote unquote, happened to them or what circumstances they found themselves in, you know, with people taking their ideas, uh, purposely, purposefully put the, putting them out of business for one reason or another, they kept going and they kept redefining themselves and their process until it paid off. And then they did one thing after it paid off. Well, actually, they did two things. They did? What were those two things? I'm really curious. Really? Yeah, I want to know. Tell me. You, you're curious. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They they practiced it. Yeah. They kept acting on it, and they kept repeating it. Okay. Practice, act, repeat. Practice, act, repeat. You know, when you're in a successful situation, you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Right. Obviously, there's some fine-tuning that's going to be necessary along the way, but once you've figured it out, Practice, act, repeat. Here's my saying for that. It's plan, do, review. 
plan, do, review. Of course, for me, it's usually shoot, ready, aim. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Go first. Shoot first, yeah. ask questions later. <laughs> That's right. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm with you on that one, man, because, <laughs> you know, you know you know my analogy. It's like riding a bike. You know, you're not going to really know how to how to balance on that thing until you get on it. I mean, there's no no amount of of preparation that's going to get you ready to do it. You got to just jump out there. And yeah. If you just jump out there, you're going to win. You know, you're you're going to figure it out. You're going to find out uh, how to ride that bike, how to balance your weight, because you're going to get tired of hitting the pavement. <laughs> yep. And the same thing will happen when you're out there trying to raise private capital for your real estate transactions. And we will get into some more details on that right after this break. Absolutely. All right. Segment one done. I didn't, see, I didn't really see when the one minute thing came up, but I did see it. That was perfect. Okay, good. All right. You guys ready? Yep, yes, sir. All right. Hey, and you know what? We're back. And uh, that was uh, a, a pretty good segment we just did. And, you know, we're really talking about raising private capital. But, you know, we just spent a full, the full first segment about you know, mindset and, and what you think is what you get. And yeah, this is a real estate show, but in order to be successful, we know what we know. And we know that you need to know that in order to be successful, you need to know that you will be successful. <laughs> All right. Well, that's right. Uh, that sounds a little circular, but it's it's vitally vitally important that's why we spend as much time as we do on it because you know when it comes right down to it uh you know you need to take some action in order to get out there and start raising some private capital correct that's, that's exactly right but you know i want to take a moment out real quick to thank everyone who has um you know been been following us and watching us listening to our podcast being here on the radio you know, being active with us at realestate360show.com. Uh, please continue to do that. Please continue to like, share, download. Uh, it, it's just great. It's great to be able to uh, communicate and interact with folks uh, about their successes or just their desires, really, as it relates to investing in real estate in a more uh, effective manner. So continue to do that. It's the Real Estate 360 Show podcast, Real, real Estate 360 Show Dot com. There it is right there. If you're watching uh, on YouTube, we're there. We're on every platform uh, you can want to be at. If you're uh, uh, whatever platform you utilize to listen to your podcast, check us out there, Real Estate 360. You're going to see everything. The four-week action plan is there. In fact, what we're talking about today, you're going to see a course there uh, about raising private capital. This is, uh, you know, this is a free course for now that we're going to share with you, giving you the basic bones of uh, how to raise private capital as we're going to discuss further within this particular show. Outstanding. And, you know, um, one of the big things that uh, really opened my eyeballs about private capital is I was at a real estate investor meeting, a, one of the RIAs. And so, one of the speakers that stood up um, said, listen, let me give you an illustration. And there, there was probably, I don't know, 50 or 100 people in the room. He said, let me give you an illustration of, of funding and real estate transactions and the different people that are probably in this room right now. So he said, okay, how many people in this room right now have a real estate transaction that they have a contract on and that they need funding for. So, you know, naturally I'm thinking, oh yeah, this is going to be some of those. And so, you know, five or 10 people raise their hand, a good number of people mm -hmm. raise their hand. Mm -hmm. said, Fantastic. Okay. Now here's another question. How many people in this room right now have money that they have available that they could put into 
a real estate transaction that made sense for them that they could lend privately to own a real estate transaction right now. And uh, you know what? About the same number of people's hands went up, five or 10 people raised their hand right then and there. So all the resources are really at your disposal mm -hmm. pretty much any time. Now, of course, we have things like the internet and other real estate uh, meetings and uh, Zoom meetings, and all kinds of things where you can meet a lot of different people uh, that have money. And this is not even talking about what you would find in the hard money segment of your quote unquote private raising private capital because you know hard money is private capital it's not you know public capital commercial capital so well, it is commercial well let's talk about that for a second because that there is a distinction there right it's serious because you have a lot of hard money lenders and i know you'll agree with me that are that are running around here saying you know, we're private money lenders. We lend private money. And they're not lying, right? Right. What, what they are is a hard money lender. What they do is raise private capital. So what's the difference? The difference is when you are going to get a hard money loan, you have to, you have to basically adhere to this, uh, these rules, these guidelines set forth by this particular group that says, okay, we're only going to lend this much money on this kind of property. You're yeah. going to pay these points. We got to get this appraisal. It's subject to this kind of approval. You're going to need uh, to use our inspectors when it's all said and done, blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, they tell you that a lot of times your credit isn't, you know, isn't necessary, but they always pull your credit at least once every six months anyway. Um, right. You know, these things are there. Now that's hard money. And then you're going to pay them anywhere between, you know, eight and eleven percent. Well, today maybe a little more in some cases, right? So let's say anywhere between eight and fifteen percent. Yeah, eight and fifteen percent. Now, private money, on the other hand, is you raising this money from private individuals. The same thing the hard money lender is doing. The difference here is you're not going to pay points, right? You're going to have ease of transaction. You're not going to have anyone, you know over your shoulder looking at your deal, uh, you're not going to have to get an appraisal. You're not going to have to pay for, you know, uh, doc preparation fees from a lender. You're not going to have to do any of those things. Okay. You're still going to have your same closing costs and all of those things, but your interest may be the same 10, 11, 12, 15%, whatever it is you've agreed to pay your investor. But instead of paying them monthly, you might pay them quarterly. OK, and then you have that money to use and reuse deal, deal after deal after deal, depending on how you structured it. So if you went out and you raised, let's just say two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And again, it doesn't have to come from one person. It could come from several people because the way you'll close these is going to be in a deed of trust. Generally, when there's multiple people. Right. That's what's going to secure your investors. So that may be enough money just to do one deal. Maybe it's enough to do a deal and take down one more deal that you have in the wings. Maybe you're going to wholesale it, or maybe it's a deal that you want to fix and flip. Just, you know, and you're going to fix and flip the first one right now. You've got the money to do that. If you know the criteria, if you know how to identify a deal and you know how to uh, identify the cost of renovation, and you know that you can fit it within those financial parameters, you're not going to have a payment on that thing at all. OK, not not at all. I know uh, there's I mean, there's just so many different ways to go about it. And it saves you thousands, that quarter million dollars that you'll probably turn uh, two times in a six month period, depending on what you do, especially if you're renovating it. That is you'll probably turn that, you know, four times a year. Right. So it's a quarter million here, and a quarter million in the second half. That's a half a million dollars. If you go to your typical hard money lenders. That's 3% right there. You know, 3% on, you know, half a million dollars is what? 15,000? Yeah. You just saved yourself $15,000. That's right. You know, and if it's four deals, you know, doc prep fees can be, for some of these lenders, you know, anywhere between 500 and and $1,000. But even on the low end, you saved yourself another four grand. That's $19,000 you've just saved yourself. Minimum. Minimum. 
Now, you know, the difference really what you're talking about is, is whether or not you as an individual real estate investor are dictating the terms of these loans or you have a private quote unquote hard money guy in the middle of your private funds that has a program uh, to dictate the terms. So in other words, who's dictating the terms, right? And of course the hard money guy, he's there to make a fee. So that's where the points come in. So he's going to add two, three, four, you know, five points, whatever he can get usually mm -hmm. onto that transaction. And that does nothing but take money, you know, certainly out of your pocket and out of the, uh, out of your overall, you know, profit margin that you're trying to achieve on, on the transaction. And, you know, it's it, a lot of times I don't even care about that. At the, at the end of the day, I mean, I do, of course, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm trying to maximize profit, but sometimes the structure of the transaction itself is more important than, than more money. So maybe I can structure something where I don't have any monthly payments uh, on a, on $250,000. I'm not deploying every single month, you know, a monthly payment on that. Mm -hmm. And, right. and that is extremely valuable to me where I don't have to deal with that. And maybe that, you know, where there's a four month or a five month or a six month uh, term on that loan, mm -hmm. it's just a commercial loan and we just pay it off and we get a payoff amount from our lender and, yep. and we're in and out. And it's just, it's just ease of transaction. And a lot of times when you're doing that, you're, you're, you're going to send the payoff in anyway. The payoff is just going, you know, to the person that, or the group of people that actually loaned you the money. And you, you know, I can't, I'd be remiss for not bringing this point up again, the ease of transaction, you know, from, from the day you closed on it to the day you actually sold it and everything in between, especially if you're doing a renovation, using private money, you're saving yourself again, whatever those inspection fees are, plus the time, the time, you know, if you've going to, if you've got four or five, sometimes six inspections coming out, it can be two or three days of downtime between each one of those. If you're paying a monthly, a monthly note on that quarter million dollars, just use that quarter million. And let's say that is $2,000 a month, right? Right. Well, if, if you've got two deals going on every six months, that's four deals, right? That's uh, roughly two to three weeks for each deal. So it's going to be five to six weeks in the first half of the year, five to six weeks. So it's 10 to 12 weeks. So it's, it's roughly another four to $6,000 in interest that you're also saving yourself. You're saving. It, well, I'm not even going to say it's savings. You're profiting an additional $25,000 a year just by being smart enough to raise private capital and paying the exact same amount in interest. And with that, let's take a break and we'll get back into this shortly. Absolutely. All right. Nice. How's your house coming along there, Sam? Good. Um, we extended the due diligence period by seven days. So that's through this Thursday to renegotiate based on the results of the inspection. The Roof is a couple years away from needing to absolutely be replaced. Mm -hmm. And then there's some gutters and stuff that could be repaired. So the seller got a roofer, gutter guy out there to get an estimate. And now we're sending a different roofer, gutter guy out there to get an estimate. And then I'm personally going to prefer and suggest that we just get the cash that they were willing to put up. Cause they said they'll put a new roof on it. Um, before, why don't we send, uh, before why don't we send guy out there. Um, so I was just like, we'll just take the cash at closing and then I'll get exactly what I want. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I, I'm guessing that, that I wouldn't love what they put on it. So Probably not. Do you want us to send uh, our, our guy out there to give you a quote? I've already got a guy going out there um, yeah. today. So another, um, another but, one, but I, but I appreciate it. Um, okay. um, but He's yeah, really it's, good. 
it's going well. You know what? I'll I will circle back with you when I want to put a roof on it. Okay. Uh, and I'll definitely use your guy. If you've got like the Michelangelo of roofs, <laughs> I want that guy. <laughs> he is close. He's his uh he's been in the business for 35 years and then he was his father was in the business for his whole life before that. So the guy's just got tons and tons of yeah. roofs. I mean, he's if he did our commercial roofs down in Columbus. He did a couple of those. It's just a lot better job and a lot cheaper. Yeah. We also we also have uh, triple K roofing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> we, we could call it KKK roofing. Yeah, Kit Kat roofing. Uh, Kit, uh, like Harry, Kit Kat construction is what he calls the company, but they're all K's. <laughs> Middle Georgia, you know, he's not really an Atlanta guy. No, he's definitely not. It's kind of more, a little more rural, you know. Out there where they, where they do bonfires, and and, and and that is not a joke, by the way. That is literally the name <laughs> of his company. That's that's an interesting choice. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's... yeah. It definitely things are going well. Um, I, think I, I, I think I think we're still going to close on July nine, so it's coming up. Um, but yeah, the, the really only thing is that the roof and the, the gutters, and I just like the cash because I'd like to hold off until 2021 if I can. Oh, yeah. Um, just to get that on another tax year. So, <laughs> um, yeah. That's smart. So it's going well. It's going well. Uh, we like it a lot. There was a little bit of uh, dried mold in the crawl space, but a very unconcerning amount. Um my bigger concern is making sure that that crawl space is like sealed off and there's no moisture getting in there. Yeah. And I, I was thinking from what I saw that if we got the roof and the drainage figured out, then enough moisture would get away from the house. Um, it's already up on a, on a little hill anyway. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. That's the but, key. You're yeah. right. Drainage is really the key. I mean, that's, that's yeah. 80% of it right there. It, it's in Tucker. It's right off of Brockett. It's on a bar circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that area. Good, good friends of mine used to live on Brockett. Yeah. Yeah. We have some good friends that live like less than a mile away from there. So it was a, a good location for that too. Wait a minute. Are you on the corner of Brockett and Tubbs? Brockett and bar. Oh, he's not in Miami. <laughs> Come on. Miami Vice, man. <laughs> it's not Brockett. It's Crockett. Oh, it's Crockett. Okay. Right. <laughs> Here, I'll show you. <laughs> so that's how I know what you're trying to say. One thing. letter oh. off. I was one letter off. There it is right there. Oh, oh my, yeah. 1960s bungalow kind of thing there. I mean, yeah. uh, ranch, the, excuse me. The inside is completely done. There won't need to be any projects done. Probably change out some light fixtures. Um, I don't really want the ceiling titties in the kitchen. I'd rather have something nicer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I call them the same thing, by the way. <laughs> but the, uh, the penny tile in the bathrooms is really well done. It's beautiful. Um, big yard. It's half an acre. Agreeable gray, mostly. Uh, that's darker gray. Oh, oh, go back to the carport. There it is. Yep. Nice. You can make that into a garage pretty quick. Oh yeah, I like the carport. I think I'd prefer the garage for the extra storage, but I mm -hmm. like it. You can you can uh, cover those up pretty easily. Yeah, but yeah, you can even see there that the roof is definitely in its later years. But Jeez. get a fresh new black roof on it. Mm -hmm. It'll look nice. And then yeah, most most of the projects will just be curb appeal and making that yard look cool. They're actually, can you see this little magnolia tree? Yes. Right here? So we had uh, an amendment because they forgot that they wanted to take this tree with them. Because they, oh, they kind, of, kind of a funny thing. Um, I don't really care because I, I think it's in a bad spot. It's going to take a while to grow. And there are a lot of, they're kind of a pain. Um, and they planted it in memorial for somebody. And so I was oh, like, man. I was like, fine, take it out. <laughs> yeah but yeah it's in good shape we actually uh we got the first offer in on it um we offered 5k over with 5k back on closing 
and it sounds like we're going to get 5k or uh, e maybe even more than 5k back because they're going to we're going to figure out what number we want back for the roof and all that. So fantastic! So you walk in maybe little or no money down. Uh, we're actually going to put quite a bit down on it. Oh. Putting, putting like because I because I want the monthly cost to be pretty low. So right. I can like travel and stuff throughout the year. So we'll probably put between 20 and 25% down on that. And mm. then uh, just loan out the rent. Mm. Yeah, um, that's good. So the, the monthly expenses will be low. Um, Tucker's not a super expensive area. So yeah, yeah, I'm having fun with it. It's It's been a good time. What's that one uh, retail for? I didn't see it on there, but was it they, 253 they, somewhere in there? They listed it 279. Okay. And uh, they had multiple offers coming in in the first 18 hours. And so we offered 284 to get it with right. five with 5K back on closing. So just kind of moved that 5,000. Um, and then I think we're going to get, I don't know how much they'll be willing to put up for the roof and stuff, hopefully five to 10. So yeah. we'll see. That's about... Um I don't know. The square footage was what seventeen, eighteen hundred. I'm guessing. Uh, almost fourteen. It's smaller. Okay. But I'm living in a six hundred square foot apartment right now, so it's going to feel huge. Yes, it oh, will. Yeah. Oh my um, god. But it's a three and two, so no problems on the resale. I don't think. Um, yeah. For us, that's about a four thousand dollar roof. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking if I could get four or five um, yeah. cash for it, then yeah. I wouldn't complain i would take it yeah so it's been fun my first one that's pretty good what did you get it for uh right now the price is 284 with five thousand uh back on closing costs mm -hmm. paid by the seller um and i'm hoping that we'll settle it at 284 with 10k back on closing costs that would be my ideal but yeah we'll see um but yeah, because we're putting so much down, we waived yeah. our we waived our appraisal contingency, so we should be in it pretty quick. Um, and then looking at all the comps, uh, we think it's valued there. So yeah, for sure. Um, especially in Tucker. So Tucker, oh, like, we'd been hunting around, and we would look at something the first day it goes up, and then we'd think about it for a day and be like, yep. okay, this is the number that we like. And then it'd be like, oh, too late. Someone already took it. So definitely a seller's market right now in Tucker. Not bad at all, I must say. And I'm going to live in it, so. Hopefully for a while. I'm tired of moving. <laughs> I hear that. All right, segment three. Hang on one second. I was there was something I was thinking about, and I can't remember what it was because I wanted to hit on this private money thing. Oh, I know what it is. Okay, uh, I'm All ready. Right. Hello, we yes. are back again. Roll State three hundred and sixty show. Yes, 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 yes. So, Steve. Yes, sir. You know, we're talking about this private money. One of the one of the biggest questions, well, it's not even a question. It's more of a, a statement that people make is, you know, I don't know anybody with money, you know, I don't know anyone with money. And um, to that, I just tell people, listen, I came to Atlanta a long time ago with nothing. I mean, no, no context, no list, no experience, none of that. And yeah, I had to get out there and get some experience and learn, you know, what I needed to do and how I was going to do it. But then it just turned into a situation where, um, you know, I just started to tell people what it was I was doing and they can see what you're doing and they want to get involved uh, in anything that makes money, people with money, especially during certain economic climates, you know, there. But for, for me, it started with friends and family people that I knew, 
and my communication with them was pretty simple. You know, I didn't go and say, hey, I need, you know, $200,000 so I can do this deal. Can you help me? I didn't do that because, you know, it's like I've got my tin cup out and rattling the coins. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's what that's how people see it when you do that. Right. So instead, I said, OK, well, listen, here's a deal that I got. You know, it's one, two, three Main Street. I'm buying it for X amount. I'm going to renovate it for this amount. We'll be able to sell it in, you know, three to four to five months, or, you know, three to four months at the time for this amount of money. I'll make this much and I'm paying this percentage on an annual basis. Do you know anyone who'd be interested in something like that? Right. And and leave it in, leave the ball in their court. That is that's the way to do it, of course. And, you know, what I've noticed is that uh, most of the real estate investors who are looking for money are thinking about it from their point of view. So they're trying to structure the transaction so that it makes sense for them. And so all of their mind thinking and their presentation and their verbiage and their communication and their whatever they put down in writing is from you know, the project point of view, but you, you can't do that. You got, well, you can do that. You should do that first, but then you've got to change your mind and jump into the mind of the person who might be lending you the money. And now you need to start thinking about it from their point of view. Mm -hmm. So why should I put my money into this transaction and then present? So as a real estate investor, we want to present it. So, here's why it makes sense for me as a real estate investor and then flip. Here's why it would make sense for you or somebody, you know, in this case, maybe not you, but maybe, you know, somebody who would like to earn 10% on their money. How's it, where's their money right now? Sitting in a bank account earning negative point, you know, 18%, whatever it is, or, 0.05% in their savings account mm -hmm. and that's in a year. And now they can get 10% and it's secured by a real piece of property. It's a first or second mortgage that's recorded and you've got title insurance on this and you've got hazard insurance on it. Now you're talking about it from the lender's point of view. Correct. And, and you know what, uh, for a lot of the people that, we're we're getting money from you know they don't know any of this stuff or they they know very little about it you know the vast majority of our private uh private money lenders are are not real estate people you know and that is a real misconception by a lot of people because they go to like going to ria's for instance you know you go to ria's yeah can you raise private capital there you sure can but you also have to remember that everyone there wants to buy real estate OK, right. or, or they want to be a, a, a lender, an actual lender of the money for the real estate. So, you know, you're 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 swimming in a pond with like fish, if you will. And you really need to separate yourself from that. Uh, our the most of the money that we get is coming from professionals. You know, we're getting I.T. professionals, doctors. Um, uh, I mean, just just people that are have some. Uh, extra cash. I don't even want to say extra cash because it's like Steve said, they're not earning what they want to earn in the market or they have CDs, you know, that aren't or, or a money market account even that isn't keeping up with inflation. And they're watching values on everything go down while the cost for everything goes up. You know, just to put it in perspective, as Steve said, let's say you have $100,000 and it's in a money market account that's giving you a half a percent a year. Right. So that hundred thousand dollars is going to earn you five hundred dollars a year. Now, inflation this year is going to be at three percent, which means next year that hundred thousand dollars is only worth ninety seven thousand dollars. So now you have ninety seven thousand five hundred dollars and you call yourself planning for the future. It's costing you money to keep your money in that bank. If you're not getting better than four percent. You're, you're losing. You are losing. And even with the 1% gain that you're actually getting to beat inflation, it's, uh, it's, not enough to, it's not enough to sustain a life unless you've got a billion and a half dollars in there. 
<laughs> exactly. And, but as real estate investors, it's our job to bridge the insecurity gap, I think, because, you know, the one thing you can say about the hundred thousand dollars sitting in a CD or a money market is whether it's worth more or more worth less in a year from now, it'll be sitting there in your bank account, right? And it's liquid. So it's our job as real estate investors to bridge the gap, the security gap, if you will, mm -hmm. and say, well, we understand that you, you know that your money will be sitting in the bank next year. And yes, it's going to be worth less, but it will be, it will be there. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. So how do we bridge that? In, really, it's more of information gap or understanding gap that uh, if they take their money out of the bank and they put it in real estate, what's the risk? Right. Well, the, you know, the, the, for me, though, Steve, the, the whole thing about that is I, I like I liken myself to a problem solver, as you know. Right. Yeah. When I'm looking at what the markets are doing, when I'm having conversations with people, especially as they get a little closer to the retirement age, when they know it's time. And we have a we have a, 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 a young lady that's uh, working with us who's retiring. And she knows that she doesn't have enough money in there to sustain her lifestyle. It's simply not enough money. So <clears throat> in, in having a conversation with her, it's very, very, we, we were able to identify very, very quickly what her pain was. Her pain is the money that she has in her uh, retirement account is not going to be enough to support her for the next 25 years of life. It's just not not counting inflation. And, you know, when you're not working, you're spending more money. People don't really look at that. You know, you're driving more, which means you're using more in gas. You're home more, which means your utilities are going to be a little more expensive because you're you're there. You know, you're going to stop off at Starbucks a little more. You're going to travel a little more because you have more time and you need to, you know, ha lead a fulfilling life, a fulfilled life. So you spend more money. And when if you make $80,000 a year and you budget for an $80,000 a year lifestyle when it's all, when you retire you're still going to have pretty much the same bills right so you have to figure out if you want to live a fulfilled life what that looks like and with her it was income 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 so how do we give you more income well we simply look at what you're earning now on an annual uh basis from your investments and offer you an income opportunity, especially when we're raising money for our multifamily stuff. You know, I mean, the single family stuff can go the same way, but the multifamily goes so much further because we can pay people, you know, 8% a year on stuff like that and give them uh, an 8% um, kick on the back when we sell it from the profit. You know, we can do that. Those things happen on a regular basis. Absolutely. You know, so now we're looking at, uh, you know, if, if she's earning uh, 5% in her retirement account, and let's just say she has a half a million in there, 5% a year is $25,000. We're paying 8%. Okay. Plus, depending on how she comes into the deal, she's getting uh, a tax write off in addition to that. Okay. Uh, a certain percentage thereof, anyway. And, you know, at 8%, the 8% we're paying, I mean, we've got some people we're actually paying 10, but at yes. the 8% we're paying on that half a million bucks, you know, that's 40,000, it's $15,000 more a year. And then when we sell that property, there's another 8% that she's going to get on that money. That's, that's huge. That's oh my massive. God. Massive. That's massive. And then, and then we can look at uh, every single personal situation and say, okay, you have income now, so you don't need a monthly payment now, or you don't have income now, so you do need a monthly payment now. Mm -hmm. and then, so we can structure all of that um, so that it makes sense for somebody who has, has money. Now, I don't know if we have those kind of uh, leeways in our multifamily syndications or not. We, we pretty much have to do everything the same for everybody in those. So she may have to take a monthly payment. 
What's right, just, and, and even those are quarterly payouts, right? So right. E- even those are quarterly payouts so that we can make sure that everything goes the way we need them to go. Uh, we have to make sure that the business is viable first and foremost. But, you know, as we're raising this money, and, and again, if someone is using a retirement account, these dollars are going back into, you know, to the into the hands of their fiduciary tax-free. Yeah. And that's huge. And tax write-offs, and that's huge. When we come back for this next segment, let's talk about a few examples that we have, maybe that we have right now, and maybe you might know somebody who has some private funds that they'd like to invest in real estate. We'll be back. All right. One more segment. You want to talk about the podcast again, Miles? Uh, yeah, I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up towards the end of the segment. Okay. Cool. Are you going to bring us back in? Sure. All right. All right. We are back. We are back. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for sticking with us. This is Jason Miles, hashtag the real estate uh, trainer, and of course, Steve Conley. And we're talking about private capital, raising private capital, and some of the things that you can do to do that. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of stories. I mean, we're telling you some stories. We're telling you some things that we've done. Uh, but I, I want to tell a real quick story, Steve, if you don't mind. Can I can I tell a quick story? Well, of course. I, I right. like stories. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So my very first time raising private capital. OK, now I, I like to think I'm a very confident guy. I'm pretty confident. I had ex- I had some experience. And uh, I knew that I wanted to find money that was more flexible, more flexible, not necessarily more affordable, although that was a part of it as well, but definitely more flexible. So I went to networking events and uh, RIAs. I, I did all those things I said don't do in the beginning, right? And ultimately wound up being introduced to people through my friends and family network. Again, the first people that invested with uh, with me were not real estate investors at all. And I presented my deal and said, here's what you're going to earn. The first real response that I got back some, from someone was, you know, this sounds like a really great opportunity. I'd love to do it. I just don't have $180,000. I only have $12,000 from a 401k that I don't use anymore. And I said, Hey, that's great. You know, it's not earning you any money anymore. The, the company, you know, when those, when they leave those companies, it's just that 401k just sits there. It's not really doing anything. Right. So you have to get a fiduciary, a middle person to be able to do something like this. So I had to guide him through. Now, this is the first time I had done it myself, but I knew that we'd need a fiduciary. So we had a relationship with another company at the time. I reached out to someone there, put those two together, and he was able to put $12,000. It was a little bit less because there were some transfer fees, but it was only about, I think, three or $400 is what it cost him to do that. But he was able to take that money, get it transferred over to the hands of the fiduciary, and then loan it to me so that we could... Uh, go ahead and do this transaction. And guess what he did? He uh, talked. Did he, do? I'm, he, I'm at this. he talked to other people that he knew. Oh, and said, "Hey, I'm investing in this real estate deal, and I was paying ten percent. You know, I'm in, in, which was at the time, you know, five percent cheaper, four or five percent cheaper uh, than any local hard money lender that we were dealing with at the time. So that was affordable money for me. That was cost effective money." But he also brought three other people. And it wasn't enough to complete that whole deal. I still had to go and do it. But I had one guy who was so excited that he was able to do something with money he thought was dead to him. Right. Okay. That's, that's a great story, man. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. he shared that he shared that experience with people that were sharing that experience with him. So those people transferred money over into that particular uh, fiduciary's hands money they thought was dead that they couldn't do anything with. And here we are all of a sudden I had nearly a hundred thousand dollars and I talked to one guy who had 12,000 bucks. You just never know. You just never know. Is going to leave. 
but, but again, it goes back to what we were talking about in the last segment, solving problems. You know, right. we just solved a problem for a guy who, who knew that there was a problem, but he had put it so far in the back of his mind, he's thinking he's not going to see that money until he's 65. Oh my gosh. You know, I mean, it's, he's, he's not even thinking about it. So this con just having the conversation excited him to the point where he could share, he was willing to share it with people that he knew that were in the same situation, because that's what happens today. People go and, and they have these jobs, these quote unquote careers, you know, they're with a company three to five years and they transfer somewhere else. And this 401k money is just, it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything. Nobody's contributing to it. It's just sitting there. And you know, that's, that's fantastic. The 401k, the IRA money, the, the Roth self-directed funds, all that. Those are very real, very viable places to find people that have money to invest in real estate. Uh, we have one of our investors that I just went down to one of the local uh, self-directed IRA uh, meetings, presentations, and just started meeting some people and happened to mention that, oh, I, I don't know if you know anybody who's interested in, uh, in you know, earning 10, 12 percent interest on on their money, investing in real estate uh, right here locally that, you, you know, you can go put your hands on. You can see it. Mm hmm insured title insurance hazard insurance first position all all the bells and whistles and uh you know we started with i think twenty five thousand with one person and now she's up to like two hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. that's exactly right and you know again this is what people need to do this is what people need to be aware of you, uh, there are these mandatory distributions that people of retirement age have to take out every year we're talking about a trillion dollars a year. Now this year, uh, they're, they've changed a lot of that because of you know the worldwide pandemic. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but there's this, yeah. what's, what's going on? There's this thing going around the uh, the uh, world that's uh, keeping people at home. So uh, these mandatory distributions that people would be normally taking that started a few years ago about maybe four or five years ago in terms of the, the super big annual amounts of money that are coming out. Yeah. And these, this, this money is going directly into the hands of, of retirees and they have to take these mandatory distributions from their retirement accounts. They're forced to do it. Now, the big question for them is, do we pay off debt or do we, or we, or do we reinvest it somewhere? Right? So most of them are doing a little bit of both because they need income. So they're going to reduce a little here, but they have to invest it over here because the life expectancy is a lot longer than it was, you know, when they started working. So, you know, they're, they're planning for a 20, 30 year after retirement life and they know they don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is there are hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars floating around out there. It's not inconceivable that you can raise a few million dollars for your real estate transactions. Not, not inconceivable at all. Not at all. Could, uh, what do you, do you think we have time if I were to illustrate one that we're working on right now? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I, I will give it a shot. Um, so one of our guys that we work with, actually this property is in Florida. And it is a fantastic opportunity for us as real estate investors. So obviously we have to crunch our numbers right there first to make sure that the project, the business, if you will, this little mini business that we're getting ready to enter into makes sense. So, uh, and, and are we solving problems for the person who has this real estate as well? So this lady in particular has uh, a house in Florida. She's it's a decent sized house, probably a couple thousand square feet. She's actually only living in, you know, three, four, five hundred square feet of the whole house. She's kind of a recluse, you know, and doesn't really have any cash flow and can't really live her life because she's saddled with this this big house. She's not in an area where she wants to be. It's out a little bit more rural. She wants to move actually over into 
Panama City, where her friends are. And um, so we made her an offer. She, she, she said what she wanted. So we're getting pretty close to that. And uh, we think with a little fix up, this house is going to be worth about 300000 And uh, so we settled in on a purchase price of 175000 with about 25, 30, well, let's say 30, 35,000 in renovation to fix it up, to make it worth 300,000. Because a lot of times with real estate, you know, there's an as is value, mm -hmm. and then there's an after repaired value. Those are different. And the difference is, is really where we as investors come along to observe, recognize, see those opportunities, and come in with the capital and the expertise to fix those issues so that we can realize that opportunity. So, so in order to get that 300, we're going to have to come in and actually do those re renovations. So bottom line, we're, we're looking at uh, borrowing from a private lender, 210,000 out of, uh, for that transaction. And um, so we'll buy that house and then we'll do the fix up on it and put it on the market. Now, what, what really makes this really unusual. And you said miles that, you know, you look, you look at yourself as a real estate problem solver mainly. Mm -hmm. Right. So in addition, this lady needs a place to live in Panama city. Now, the cool thing is she doesn't really owe that much on this house. So she's going to have a lot of free cash. So our team down there suggested that, hey, we'll find a lot and build her a little mini house. You know, what she wants, which is about 600 square feet, not, nothing big. She doesn't want anything big. So we'll come in and we'll build her, find a lot that she likes, a location that she wants to be in, do a plan for a house that she, she wants and that's functional for her. She'll just come in and pay cash and have like $80,000 invested in the whole thing. So she'll end up with about 90,000 in cash out of this. So she can actually live a life right now. She can't go anywhere. She can't do anything. She can't afford to pay her transportation, gas for the car, anything. So we're, we're going to give this lady her life back. Mm -hmm. And so now does it make sense for a real estate investor to come in with 210,000? The backstory is compelling helping somebody. And at the same time, helping us with our business. And at the same time, we, you know, we're going to pay 10% interest on that money uh, and only have it for six months. Cause it's going to take us about 60 days to build that little mini house. We're going to actually pay, move this lady over into it. And we're going to take care of everything for her. We're going to kind of hold her hand into her new lifestyle and to get her, get her back over into a place where she can have some fun with her friends. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the problem solving, you know, you're doing it. But Steve, I just want to touch base real quick. I mean, bottom line, that's what we do, guys. We solve problems when we help people. That's what this is. And we make money in doing it. Uh, if you want to know more about this, check out realestate360show.com. Uh, there is a program there that right now we're giving away for free, how to raise private capital, the, the basic bare bones of it, Okay. Uh, you just got to go to realestate360show.com and make sure that you continue to subscribe again. I can't stress it enough. I want to just take an opportunity to thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank our team. Thank you, everyone, for making sure that these broadcasts look, sound, and feel great. So thank you all, and uh, I look forward to seeing you here next week. All right. That's a wrap. 59 minutes, is that